Our hearts will form a sandboard You hovered over our waters There was light at the sound of your voice With every new sunrise We will come alive You bring life where there is none In the wilderness We'll remember where there is none Welcome to our YouTube video for this weekend. This particular weekend is pretty exciting for us. It's the last weekend, actually back in Washington, D.C., of, <laughs> of the Cherry Blossom Festival. And Jan and I had the opportunity to be there the last couple of days with my brother Brian and Valentina and nephew Canute and my sister Bennett. We had a great time, beautiful, beautiful day. We went down to what's called the Tidal Basin and saw hundreds and hundreds of Japanese cherry blossoms, uh, cherry blossom trees, and just really had a great time. It's a really neat time of celebration in that time of year, fun time of year as, as creation springs to life. And so I imagine we'll be seeing some pictures from those trees over the next few weeks in the montages. Huge thanks to Jan for her work on the montages. And it's just so fun to see the, the color and the beauty of nature and creation and then the wonder of humanity and human beings who are made to be, in Christ, new creations. This is also for us at church, at Pilgrim. Pretty special weekend. We have the Hillcrest Lutheran Academy Choir coming in Sunday night at 7 o'clock. If you're in the area, I really encourage you to come out, join us for that concert. And the teens are from Hillcrest Academy, which is a church of Lutheran Brethren. 
boarding school slash high school. And just has been a great place for young people to meet Christ and to discover his place in their life. And the teens make a regular trip or regular trips, I guess, now that the pandemic is sort of over uh, and are making those trips. And we just really encourage you to come and see them on, on Sunday. Also, we have, a, by the way, it's almost Easter. I think this is the fourth Sunday, the fourth weekend in Lent. And, and so Easter is coming soon. Uh, we're going to have an Easter festival on April the 6th, the Wednesday night. We need to have you sign up, your, sign your kids up for that. And that's at RSVP on our website. So go to that, join us for that festival. We'd really love to see you at that. So our message for today is called New Creation. It's, it's a passage out of 2 Corinthians, and it's the pericope, pericope epistle for this Sunday. And I really encourage you to turn to this passage, if you would, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to be looking at a few verses there, celebrating us as believers as new creations in Christ Jesus. So I'll turn to that. I encourage you to head to... The, the book of 2 Corinthians, which is about two-thirds of the way into the New Testament, Paul writes to the Christians in Corinth, and he's writing um, just with joy over, over the, the church's love for Christ and who they are in Christ. It's a church that's had a lot of issues, a lot of trouble, but they're, they're experiencing a time of repentance, and Paul recognizes this. So grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 5, 2 Corinthians, verses 16 through 21. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would open our hearts to your word today. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear, hearts which embrace the truth of your word. This day, as we continue to pray for the people of Ukraine, reminded of this scripture from Daniel, Lord, listen, Lord, forgive, Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. And that's certainly a reference to Jerusalem. But any time where we hear about believers struggling and experiencing persecution, we cry out with that prayer, because your city, your people bear your name. Watch over them, protect them, keep them. And then we pray for peace. And that those who are involved in bringing peace to this nation and to this region could do so quickly. We pray that you would that you would work that. And then for the other prayers that we have, for the requests that we have, for the choir that's coming in uh, on Sunday, for the April festival, that's or the Easter festival that's coming up soon, and for Easter and services and everything that takes place during this time of year, we pray that you would place your hand on your people here and around <laughs> and around the world, and that you would place your hands on us, that we would hear from you and live. Thank you for making us into new creations. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. So we are watching a skit on Sunday at church, and it's a, it's a pretty cool skit about a makeover before the makeover. So someone's going to win a makeover for a house, and then because of that, decides, well, I got to I got to paint, and I got to clean, and I got to do all these things before. Why? Because they're going to come in and make over your house, but it's got to be—it's got to look be good before they get there, right? And we know—we know how that goes. <laughs> We're like, I'm going to go to the doctor, but I got to make sure I'm healthy and clean before I go to the doctor, right? Why a makeover before the makeover? And we think about that spiritually, and you go, why? Why fix ourselves up before we go to God seeking His forgiveness and salvation? Because we're human. One. <laughs> Because we don't, 
because we want to do it ourselves, don't we? We want to impress God ourselves. Uh, we have a grandchild who's just living this out in front of us right now, our youngest, Elliot. I want to do it myself. I can do it. I can do it. And, and that's just such a neat spirit and just such a determination. I can do it. But oftentimes he can't. And so we need to help him or do it for him. Or we don't want to admit we're sinful, right? And so like the Fonz will say, I was wrong. And we can't get ourselves to say I was wrong or I made a mistake or I sinned. And God is calling us to acknowledge our weakness, our helplessness and our sinfulness. In this, in this message. For Christ's love compels us. This is going back to verse 14. Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So the cross is tied to the new creation, right? And the cross is given for those who can't save themselves. We would sing that song, Just As I Am, without one plea, but that your blood was shed for me. O Lamb of God, I come, I come. And it's a simple cry of faith. I can't save myself. I can't, I can't fix myself up and then come to you for salvation. Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. And so you have this great message of Christ dying for our sins and us dying to ourselves. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. And so Christ dies on the cross and the cross is tied to new life in him and to us being new creations. Lenski says this, and I love this. The law, what the law couldn't do because of our sinful nature, God does for us, not by his power, and God doesn't overpower us and force us to become believers, but by his grace and his goodness and his mercy. He sends Christ to die for our sins. Christ dies on the cross as the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. And through his grace, we're invited, we're invited to become his new creations new creations in Jesus Christ. Look at Romans 5, 20 through 21. I'm going to look at Romans 5 a couple of times, so keep your finger in Romans 5 and in that 2 Corinthians passage. So Romans 5, 20 through 21. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. Our sin would look all the more sinful. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness, to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So grace reigns. It's through Christ and his grace that we become new creations. The cross, the message of Jesus, and his great sacrifice for our sins leads to us becoming new creations. So we are new creations. Look at chapter 5, verses 16 through 17, again in 2 Corinthians. Chapter, or chapter 16, verses uh, 5, verses 16 and 17. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. And so we be become new creations in Christ. And this is pretty interesting because Paul is saying from a worldly point of view, I think he's talking about himself and how he, before he became a believer, saw Christ as a threat and the people of Christ as a threat. And so he persecuted and punished the Christians. And so he's, he's saying, I, I admit I saw Christ in that way from before, before I became a believer. I regarded Christ in this way, but I do so no longer, or we do so no longer. Therefore, if we're in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. We are new creations. Those of us who are believers, we're new creations. And how do we even begin to understand that? What does that even mean? And it's, it's really fun because uh, there, it's just, we just highlight this great truth that we are new creations in Christ Jesus. So from, <laughs> from A.W. Knock, a book from Bob Skillman, and I love this. It's called Who's, <laughs> Who's Who in You? Who's Who in You? 
and it highlights the, the reality of having a sinful nature, but also of having a new nature, a Christ nature, the new creation in us. And as believers, that new creation, uh, we believe, should be dominant in our lives and that we are new creations reflecting this new life in Christ. The old nature can never be cleaned up. It can never be, <laughs> it can never be con converted or changed or any of those things. But we're given a new creation in Christ. And I love that. We're made new in him. So who's who in you or what's new in you is this new creation that we're given. And A.W. Knox's book celebrates this, this great truth that Christ is in us. Christ, who is the hope of glory. We say Christ within us, the hope of glory. Here is Knox's book. He says it can't be done. What you cannot do with your old nature, you cannot make it good. Number one, you cannot make it good. Number two, you cannot improve the old nature. Number three, you cannot eradicate your old nature. And number four, you cannot save your old nature. Can't improve it, can't eradicate it, can't save it, can't make it good. The old nature is a sinful nature, and we're called to kill off the old nature, not to try and improve it. What does a new creation bring? The new creation, and, and listen to this amazing list of some of the things that happen to us as new creation. Number one is we do become a new creation in Christ. Number two, we're given a new worldview. And then we're given new beginnings, new ministry new relationships, new identity, new direction, new destiny, new place and position, new purpose, new home, and then finally, new bodies, new strong, healthy bodies. One day, one day. Who's who in you? Christ in us, the hope of glory. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. Then the new creation is tied to this great ministry of God toward us and then us toward the world, a ministry of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 19. All of this is from God, this new creation business. It's all from God who reconciled to us himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliations. As new, as new creations were brought back to peace with God, made new, made at peace. I mentioned last week how important that was for Martin Luther and his experience of faith. It was just this deep desire to be at peace with God. And maybe we don't sense that so much today. I don't know. I think many of us do, but maybe some don't and just don't see that importance of being at peace with God. And in Luther's experience, it was just so extreme. And I think for many of us, it's a very extreme need. For all of us, it's important to be made at peace with God. And that happens through Christ and the cross and what he accomplishes on the cross. We're by nature kind of at war with him and then we're brought back to peace with him. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. So go back to Romans. Once again, sixth book of the New Testament. Book of Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. And I think we like to think that God loves us because we're pretty lovable. But listen, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's kind of a black and white statement. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not so, lovable, not so lovable, at war, we are reconciled to God through what Christ does for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You are reconciled to him. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And then he begins to talk about this ministry, that this is something new in us, is this new ministry, a ministry of bringing peace. He's committed to us the ministry of reconciliation or the message of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. 
and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We are given a new ministry, the ministry of reconciliation. And boy, in light of the the world events that are taking place today, the Russian aggression against Ukraine and the sadness of so much of what we see, we see ambassadors from different countries that are that are making pleas to the Russians, please stop this senseless slaughter. And we hear that and we see that again and again, and we go, well, they're kind of ministers of reconciliation, but not accomplishing a whole lot, it doesn't seem. And then we pray for peace and we pray for world peace and we pray for a stop to what's taking place. We know that we're experiencing that firsthand right now. God, please save these people, save these people. We are given an opportunity to, to, to go to our world, to, to the people around us who we teach and believe without Christ are dying without hope. And we have a message of peace, of peace with God, of reconciliation to bring to these folks. Paul says that's your responsibility. It's your opportunity now to go with this message, this message of reconciliation. We are his ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. And it's an interesting thing that God chooses to use us as fallen, as troubled as we might might be. We have this appealing message to bring. Are we willing to do this? To tell the story of Christ, to tell the story of Easter, to tell the story of Lent to the people around us. This great message. We're praying for peace. We're praying for you, for, for you to come to peace. And right now is a great opportunity, I think, because everyone is interested in peace and talking about peace for us to say, hey, above all, we have a message of peace with God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Be reconciled to him. And then here's to the heart of our message, verse 21. And I want to highlight this. The amazing truth that God made Jesus, who knew no sin, Jesus, the perfect son of God, The God-man, Christ, who knew no sin to become sin for us, to become the great sacrifice for sin for all time. It's pretty interesting because we have absolute confidence that Jesus never sinned. Remember Herod and Pilate? Pilate says, as Jesus is on trial, I find no fault in this man. And then he actually says, and Pilate didn't either. Pilate didn't find fault with him either. Or Herod didn't find fault with him either. The word is, Jesus is the perfect son of God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Our message, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, who had no sin to become sin for us, to take on the sin of the world. Not that he sinned, but that he as a sacrifice takes on the sin of the world so that we might become the righteousness of God. Go back to Romans chapter 5. I'm going to read one more passage. Romans chapter 5, verses 9 through 11, and verse 17. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Verses 9 through 11. I already read part of this. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? So we are reconciled. Now we're saved through his life. And not only is this so, but we boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received reconciliation. It is just such a great message. In Christ, we've received this. Now we go and we share it with others, but we live in this great truth that we have been reconciled by God through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Amen.